One nice feature of the mini lathes that's not found on some of the uh, smaller micro lathes is the power feed and threading feature and it operates by drawing power from the lead screw which is in turn powered from uh, the spindle by a gear train that we'll look at in a minute. But with the spindle turning and the gear train engaged, the lead screw is now rotating. And if we then engage the half nut lever, the carriage locks onto the lead screw and the carriage begins to move under power. You can see the hand wheel is turning uh, by power derived from the lead screw. And as we approach the uh, workpiece, and I'll let me uh, line it up here, as we approach the end of the workpiece, it will begin to cut along the length of the workpiece using the power drive from the lead screw. Now there are two advantages to doing that. One is that if you're taking a relatively long cut, it just uh, removes some of the tedium of having to turn the hand wheel by hand. Uh, you can just power feed it and let it run along and then withdraw it by hand and run it back again until you've cut to the diameter that you want. Uh, but secondly, because the power feed feeds very evenly compared to turning the hand crank, you get a, must, a nice smooth and even finish that's hard to achieve when you're uh, turning by hand. Now just as when turning by hand, when you're turning under power, typically you'll make one or more coarse cuts and then uh, one final finishing cut of just a few thousandths to get a nice, a nice smooth and even uh, surface finish on the last pass. Looking at the left end of the lathe, we can see the gear train, which is driven by the rotating spindle and then through these two tumbler gears, these white gears here, and on down to the lead screw, which actually uh, links up with the carriage. Now this lever here controls the direction of lead screw movement, and if it's in the upper position, the lead screw moves in the forward direction, and then there's a detent here, which is the neutral position, and another detent down below, which is the reverse position. So in this position, the lead screw turns in the opposite direction, and the carriage will move away from the headstock. So normally uh, most cutting is done or under power with the lead screw turning in the forward direction. Now there's only two real differences between thread cutting and power feed. And one is that for power feed you use a very low gear ratio and what we have is a 20 tooth and 80 tooth which gives you a 4 to 1 ratio and then another 20 tooth and 80 tooth which gives you another 4 to 1 so the combination of all these gears gives you a 16 to 1 ratio. Then the lead screw itself has 16 threads per inch. So you get a total reduction of 1 to 256 or 200. It's so effectively the same as turning a 256 threads per inch thread. And that combined with the blunt tip of your cutting tool uh, when you're turning gives you a nice smooth finish. Whereas with threading you're using a pointed tip and you actually cut the threads. Now over here on the front of the carriage is this lever known as the half nut lever and it engages or disengages the carriage from the lead screw. So if the lead screw is turning and we engage the half nut lever, the carriage now begins to move under power from the lead screw. And you can see it moves along at a pretty slow pace and then we just speed up the uh, motor. the uh, movement of the carriage will speed up proportionately to the motor speed, but the ratio between them remains fixed. I'm now going to move the threading dial so that we can get a closer look at the half nuts and see how they work. So if I zoom down in here, you may be able to see the half nuts down inside here. And what they are is it's like a nut that's split. In fact, sometimes it's called a split nut and the half nut lever opens and closes the two sides of the half nut. When they're in the closed position, they grip onto the lead screw and cause the carriage to move under power. And then when they're opened up, it releases the lead screw and the carriage stops moving. So let's uh, turn the, the lead screw on here. And now I'll bring the carriage back a little bit 
and I'll lower the half nut lever and you can see now that the uh, if we look at the carriage hand wheel you can see that it's turning and the carriage is now moving along under power from the uh, half nuts when I release it the carriage stops moving okay so that's how the uh, half nut lever works most of the time if I need to cut threads on the lathe I use taps and dies because it's quicker and easier but here's one example of where a tap and a die can't be used I guess they could if you could get one in the size that you need but uh, this is a little microscope light I made for a stereo microscope and I needed to put a male thread here and a female thread on the inside diameter and as you can see this is not any sort of standard diameter but it doesn't matter the thread pitch is standard and I don't remember what it is but as you can see this uh, just threads right in there and uh, holds the uh, high intensity light in place in this little light holder the mini lathe can cut a pretty wide range of both inch and metric threads as shown by this uh, these two charts here in page 32 of the user manual and as you can see they start out at four threads per inch which is a very coarse thread and run all the way down to 80 threads per inch which is a very very fine thread in fact that, that's what you'd find on a, a number 080 screw over on the metric side of the table here we see that you can cut threads from 0.3 millimeters down to 8 millimeter pitch so you've got a very wide range there and uh, can fit just about any uh, nut or bolt that you might need to make a thread for on lays that are in the two thousand dollar and up price range and 2015 prices you typically have some sort of knob or lever arrangement and for cutting threads you look on a chart and just set the uh, the selectors to what you want for example C3 for a particular pitch so you look up your pitch on a chart and then it tells you where to set the levers and inside of here there's a whole range of gears that are operated by these knobs and so it's very quick and convenient uh, but as I say you only find those on the high-end lathes now by contrast on the mini lathe and most other low-cost lathes that have thread cutting capability you have to set up the gear trains manually and I'll show you now how that's done now we already saw that there's a pretty comprehensive list of threads pitches both inch and metric in the user manual but there's also an abbreviated chart here on the uh, gearbox cover that has a lot of the more commonly used inch threads so for example if we wanted to cut a 20 pitch thread or 20 threads per inch uh, we look here on the chart and it says 20 and there are three gears required and a 40 tooth gear a 65 tooth gear and a 50 tooth gear then looking at the columns of the chart a b c and d those correspond to these shaft positions so this is the a shaft position the b shaft position the C shaft position and the D shaft position so for the uh, 20 pitch thread there's no gear used in the C shaft position so there's just a slash shown there so some uh, gear pitches for example this 19 require four gears whereas others such as this 20 only require three gears to set up a gear train there are two size wrenches required this one is a five millimeter and is used for this bolt here once we loosen that we can uh, just remove it but there is a washer behind here and you want to be careful not to uh, lose track of the washer once you have the uh, washer and screw removed you can pry off this gear and I've removed this multiple times so it comes off pretty easily but very often on a brand new lathe these are on here very tightly and you'll need to prise them off gently using a pair of flat bladed screwdrivers okay now we can get access to remove this other gear and in this case we need a four millimeter wrench and once again we have a washer here and uh, this has two gears actually that come off together and they're held together uh, by this little uh, sleeve that goes in between them and they can come apart and I can use this sleeve uh, for other gear combinations now you also have to be careful not to lose this little spacer here this is used for various gear combinations 
depending on whether the gear needs to go on the inner position of the chart or the outer position. That's the B or the C position. Now with those gears removed we can better see the shaft positions. And this is the A shaft position which still has a 20 tooth gear in place and this uh, shaft here is both the B and the C positions and as we just saw there's a little sleeve that uh, can go on that shaft and we can put our gears pair of gears on here if uh, that's what's called for and then over here is our D shaft position. Well let's say we wanted to cut a 20 pitch thread or 20 threads per inch so we look at our chart and we see that we need a 40 tooth gear a 65 tooth gear then there's no gear in the C position and then in the D position we need a 50 tooth gear so next we'll select our gears and uh, get them ready to put on the various shafts all right, I've gone through our stack of gears and I've selected a 40 tooth gear. You can see they're numbered here. Uh, I can't tell if you can see or not because of the reflections, but there's a 40 tooth, a 50 tooth, and a 65 tooth. So these are the three gears we'll use to set up our gear train. I need to go ahead and remove this 20 tooth gear here from the A shaft and we'll just set that aside since it's not needed. And one thing you have to be careful of, uh, these shafts have little keys on them uh, that go in keyways and you want to be careful you don't uh, knock those little keys out of place there and lose them. Some of them are loose and come out easily like this one. Others are kind of tight in there and usually need a pair of pliers if you need to remove them for some reason. But for uh, setting up and taking down gear trains they normally do not need to be removed. So just watch out for them that they don't get uh, knocked out of place and lost. So our chart tells me that I need a, a 40 tooth gear in position A. So we'll go ahead and slide that in place. And here again, this one's pretty stiff. It's probably never been used before. And then I can go ahead and put the little screw and washer back in place to hold it in, in uh, its position there. Now in order to get these other gears in place, and I may have to actually remove these. Sometimes there's a particular sequence in which you need to put the gears in place because uh, larger gears have to go in place sometimes before smaller gears as we'll see in a minute. But this is the uh, tricky part of setting up a gear train is you have to loosen this nut here and that allows this arm to swing freely along this arc and that just allows you to adjust for gears of various diameters. Then reaching behind here there's another nut that, uh, and I always do this backwards, it's easier if you do the one in back first keep this one tight and, uh, and I always have to think about which direction this goes but because you're working backwards but you have to loosen this nut and now once that's loose I can slide this uh, shaft here. Now I'm working in a pretty awkward position because of the camera is <laughs> in the way of where I need to be standing so that makes this harder than it uh, even would be normally. But it's always a little bit of an awkward uh, job until you get used to how all these things go together. So with these two parts loose now, I can swing this freely up and down and I can move this shaft in and out to compensate for the diameters of the gears. So the next gear I need now is the uh, 65 tooth gear on the B shaft. So we'll take that. 65 tooth and it's going to go in the inner position on the B shaft and I got to line that up with the uh, key and here again it's kind of stiff. Now as we saw earlier the C position for this particular gear train is not used so what I'm going to do is uh, take my 20 tooth gear which we removed a minute ago and I'm going to put that on this shaft and use it as a spacer so it's not actually involved in the gear train but because this 65 tooth gear is in the inner position, I need a spacer here to uh, keep it from sliding in and out. And now we can put uh, our final screw in place here and we have our gear train. So we've got a 40 tooth gear, a 65 tooth gear, and a 50 tooth gear. And I could check and see I've got enough clearance there, they're not binding. So I'm ready to uh, do a test cut and see uh, if it's the right pitch. With our gear train now set up for 20 threads per inch, 
I've selected this threading tool which is just a uh, 5 16 inch square uh, tool blank that's been ground to a point and we'll insert that in the tool post and go ahead and make our test cut. For this demonstration I'm just going to illustrate the idea of uh, making a pass for cutting threads but in actual practice there are other things you have to deal with but uh, since this is not really a threading tutorial I'm not going to go into all that detail here but I've positioned the tool now near the end of the workpiece and uh, we're ready to take a light cut so let's go ahead and do that and I'll turn on the motor and I'll engage the half nut and I want to run the uh, motor at a very low speed because you'll see that the tool advances quite quickly now the trick is at the end of your cut you have to quickly withdraw the tool uh, as it runs up or is about to run up on this part of the material that's not intended to be part of the thread and ordinarily when you're cutting threads you leave a uh, you have a recess here uh, which makes a convenient stopping point at the end of the thread well, let's check that with our thread gauge and see uh, if we got the thread that we want well this is the uh, moment of truth and I've selected my uh, 20 pitch thread there and it does seem to match which tells me that I set the gears up properly so this is always a good idea is to take a very light initial cut and then check it with your gauge to make sure you indeed uh, have the thread pitch that you intended to have. In actual practice when you're cutting threads on the mini lathe or really on any metal lathe you have to make multiple passes to get the thread to the desired depth and uh, when you make successive passes you have to avoid cutting over the threads that you've cut on previous passes and the way you do that is to use the threading dial and this little uh, indicator here tells you the points at which you can uh, engage the half nut lever so that the lead screw will be synchronized with your previous cuts that you've made so that you don't cut through the thread that's already been cut now over here on the headstock is a little chart and we'll take a look at that this chart tells you the numbers on the threading dial indicator at which you can engage the half nut lever to synchronize the thread that you're cutting. So for example, we're cutting a 20 pitch thread. We can engage the half nut lever at any of the positions 1, 3, 5, or 7. But if we are cutting a 19 pitch thread, we must engage it only at the 1 position to keep it synchronized. And similarly, if we were cutting a 16 pitch thread, we could engage the half nut lever at any of the positions on the threading dial indicator 1 through 8. Because the mini lathe has a reversible motor there's an alternate procedure you can use for thread cutting without using the threading dial at all and in that procedure you just keep the half nut engaged the half nut lever engaged for the entire process and because the half nut lever is always engaged with the lead screw there's no risk of losing synchronization between passes. Then at the end of each pass you use the reversible motor to uh, back up the carriage. So we'll make one pass then at the end of that pass we back out the tool, reverse the motor, go back to our starting point, advance the cross slide back, put the motor back in the forward direction, make our next pass, and so forth. So I'm just simulating this here, but the idea is that for each successive pass, we never disengage the lead screw, and therefore we maintain our synchronization between the lead screw and the thread that we're cutting. Well, that wraps up our quick look at the thread cutting capabilities on the mini lathe. But thread cutting is a fairly detailed topic, and if you want to learn more about it, you may want to take a look at the premium content section on minilathe.com, and you'll find a uh, more detailed tutorial there. It's in text format rather than video, but I think there's a lot of good content there that will help you get started. So let's move on now to part 10.